Okay, so quick recap since we haven't met in a while. We are discussing the idea of noise in quantum systems. We saw that noise must imply some kind of non unitary evolution. And so, what kind of uh, evolution happens, which is outside the purview of what we already know from standard quantum mechanics, which is unitary evolution. So, that in turn comes from having an open quantum system. So, we did this in two ways. We looked at a kind of system interacting with an environment via a joint unitary. And then we said, if you're only interested in what happens to the system, then uh, the system state alone no longer undergoes unitary evolution, rather the joint system undergoes unitary evolution and then you trace out the environment. So we had a circuit picture for this, which is to say that so you think of a joint unitary between two uh, registers, think of this as system, think of this as environment and then you ask what happens to the system state alone, then so I'll put row subscript s, then that is a map, you are tracing out the environment. Tracing out is essentially our way of saying that we don't uh, have control over those degrees of freedom, we don't even care what happens to the environment degrees of freedom actually. And maybe there are just too many uh, degrees of freedom for us to even measure or detect what's happening there. Rather what we would like to know is only what happened to system, right? And often you can just assume that the environment starts in some fixed pure state which we designate as our ket0. Right? So, this is a circuit picture for this and all of this adds up to the fact that noise is mathematically represented as a map and as a particular kind of map, namely a completely positive trace preserving map which acts on the set of states on the system Hilbert space to the set of states on the system Hilbert space. So, this S denotes the set of all density matrices on the system or whichever uh, density operators on the system Hilbert space or whatever you want to think of as an input Hilbert space or whatever. It could be that the output space is different from the input, but without loss of generality, we can assume that it is a map from one Hilbert space. Uh, operators on one Hilbert space, two operators on the Hil same Hilbert space. And this map must be completely positive, which means that any arbitrary extension of the map to some other system, and I put an R to say that this is some other system that this is acting on. This is some joint density operator. So, this also gives a valid positive semi-definite operator. This output is also positive semi-definite. And also, the trace of E is also 1. So, trace of E acting on some density matrix, the output is obviously a density matrix. So, that also has trace 1. So, both of these capture the fact that the map is CPTP, right? And then we discussed uh, some theorem which says that if you have a CPTP map, then there is always a representation. of this map via an operator sum decomposition in other words the action of this map on a state row can be described in a simple way like this where ei are some set of operators on so, let's say i going from 1 to some capital N, this is some set of operators or matrices on this Hilbert space that one is interested in. 
such that sum over i going from 1 to n ei dagger ei is identity uh, this is just identity like this this is identity on the system space so i put a double line here to indicate that this is the identity map right and remember we said that when i write something like this this is like a function it's a function from density operator to density operator so that's what we call this map e right and what's sitting here is the argument when i put a double line like this and write this this is the identity map it's the map that does nothing to the density operators right but when i simply write a capital i like this i mean the identity matrix on the space okay just have to be a bit careful here with the notation because you're talking about an operation on operators right so you're mapping a set of positive semi definite trace one matrices from one uh, basically a map from the se set of positive uh, semi definite trace one matrices to itself right that's what these maps are okay so this theorem we stated and we proved and this is what we call the choi krauss sudarshan theorem it says that there exists such a set of operators always which describes the action of the map and then we started looking at some examples of this so this is as much of the theory as we have done so far right and what we will do today also is to look at some more interesting examples of this some of this you did in the tutorial session as well but some of this we'll revisit today and we will also look at uh we'll we'll look a bit more closely at this operator sum representation including questions like is such a representation unique if it is not unique then how do you go from one representation to another is there a way to characterize for example what are all the set of representations for a given cptp map and so on okay questions any questions so far Wow. all right thank you for answering that okay otherwise i was worried if i was talking to myself all right so the simplest examples of these kind of maps are the maps that uh, are similar to what is studied in classical uh, in the classical theory of communication so let's look at the simplest example which is the bit flip channel so we can look at this in two ways one is to simply look at what it does so maybe i have to point out that my examples right now will be all restricted to qubits right so these will be maps so these will basically be cptp maps on qubit density operators right so we'll focus our attention purely on qubit systems and one way to understand the action of such a map is to look at what it does to a pair of orthogonal states right and the natural choice is to pick ket0 and ket1 so we said that the bit flip channel with some probability 1 minus p so p is just a parameter between 0 and 1 so 1 minus p becomes probability of having no bit flip and p will be the probability of a single bit flip right so with probability 1 minus p it does nothing to ket0 and ket1 with probability p it flips 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 right this uh, intuitively captures what we mean by a bit flip channel right again we contrasted this we looked at how this is different from just a unitary operation so a unitary operation would deterministically flip the 1 to a 0 and the 0 to a 1 and this is of course achieved by your sigma x matrix i'll simply call this the x matrix in this course right 
uh, and this is of course the matrix with elements 0 1 1 0 right so this is a unitary transformation in this case you know that if your input was ket 0 so in some sense you're thinking of what i wrote on the left is the input and this is the output another way of thinking about it is this is what goes into the argument of that map and this is the uh, this is what happens after the action of the map right so in the case of a unitary map or a unitary channel of course i also mentioned that these are special uh, cases of such cptp maps right the simplest case is in fact just a unit uh, a unitary map right where there is only one kraus operator of course these operators are called kraus operators In the case of a unitary channel or a unitary map, there is a, just one Krauss operator, which is that unitary matrix itself, right? But now, this becomes a channel or this becomes a non-trivial CPTP map if it acts in this fashion, the way we have written here, right? So, how does one go from just having a single X matrix acting on the state? to achieving this kind of a situation where with some probability you have the action of the X matrix and with some probability the state is left undisturbed. So the way to visualize this is to now have a mixture of this, right? And this is neatly captured by the operator sum representation. So you can visualize this now in terms of two Krauss operators. One is just identity, but rather than just write I, I'm going to write this with the prefactor because I know that these Krauss operators also have to satisfy this um, sort of normalization kind of condition, right? Where they have to uh, sum up to identity. Uh, the operator adjoint times the operator has to sum up to identity. So I'm going to write this as square root one minus P identity and square root P X. And these are the two Krauss operators which describe the bit flip channel. So you can, of course, uh, then, of course, uh, so if I write E, I'll put a subscript B here to say that this is bit flip, okay? Acting on any state row will therefore be square root one minus P, I row square root one minus P, I. So that simply becomes one minus P row plus P times X row, X dagger, and X dagger is nothing but X because these are Hermitian matrices apart from being unitary. So now you can check that this achieves this functionality, which one uh, has first written down here, mimicking the classical case of a bit flip. Uh, in the classical case, this is called a binary symmetric channel or a bit flip channel again. So this acting on the zero state, remember we write this as a density matrix, will simply be one minus P zero plus P one. Right, so this is now a mixture, it's a convex mixture of these two pure states, 0 and 1, right. But what you started out with here was a pure state. So the input was a pure state, but the output is a convex mixture of two pure states, similarly with 1. And so this is what captures the same sort of functionality as what you expect from a classical bit flip channel, right? Now, of course, the key different co difference comes in in the fact that in the classical case, you just had 0 going to 1 or 1 going to 0, and that was it. But now in the quantum case, you don't just have the 0 and the 1, you have all possible superpositions of 0 and 1 and so you could think of an arbitrary superposition of 0 and 1 which is of the form alpha 0 plus beta 1 right and under the action of this channel again it's no longer going to be a pure state with some probability it's going to remain what it is and with some other probability it's going to become alpha 1 plus beta 0 right So more generally, you can think of having an arbitrary input density matrix 
uh, here and this is what happens to it right okay so what is this probability p here so i maybe let's you can do this as an exercise so if i call this as psi okay you can work out starting with psi psi what is e of psi psi in this case okay just as a simple exercise for you to work on. now this probability p right which seems to decide in some sense to what extent does the flip happen right okay so before i discuss that let me talk in terms of the error operator so let me talk in terms of errors and error operators so note that if i started with a zero and i go to a one right this is what would be called a bit flip error right you can imagine that in some circuit i prepared the state zero right and as i am doing some gate operation this zero in the process of me doing the gate operation or because there was some wait time before the gate operation happened suddenly gets flipped to a one and then the gate operation happens then the output obviously is going to be g acting on one and not g acting on zero which is what we originally wanted right so the action of this channel causes errors right and zero going to one or one going to zero is what we would call a bit flip error in this case it's symmetric because both happen with equal likelihood the zero going to one or the one going to zero happens with equal likelihood so these are the errors right the fact that what was a zero does not remain a zero more generally what was a zero plus one has become a one plus zero with uh, so this kind of changes right this changes all your uh, superposition coefficients it changes um if you look at this for example in the plus minus basis you notice that it introduces phase uh changes right and so on and so forth so this is where the idea of an error or a noise comes in and the error operator in this case so you talk about error in the quantum setting you always talk about error operators and because we have a mathematical description of this in terms of these maps and these operators some decomposition the error operators are nothing but the krauss operator so when i talk about bit flip noise this is what i mean i mean that with some probability the state remains unchanged and with some probability it gets flipped by the action of an x operator and the error operators therefore are simply the krauss operators of the map and these krauss operators are in this case identity and x so i will say that the error operators in this case are identity and x and they act with different probabilities depending on what this value of p is okay so what is this probability now so p essentially becomes the probability with which the error affects the state right because remember that rho goes to 1 minus p rho plus p x rho x dagger so p is the probability with which the bit flip error happens the probability with which the x operator gets applied physically this p is actually a function of time because the, in the situation that i just described that i have prepared my qubit in the one state and then i want to do some operation on it let's say it's a hadamard right but in the time that it took me to execute the hadamard gate the q, the one uh flip to a zero now this is not going to be a this is not going to happen like a step function right in a physical process it has to happen in some continuous way and this 
the continuous way in this which happens is modeled by this probability parameter or this this probability is, this is also often called a noise parameter because in a sense this probability also captures the strength of the noise right so this is also often called a noise parameter and this is some function of time and you can imagine that if i did not really wait very long and i was able to execute this hadamard gate very fast then i might have minimized the chances of the one getting flipped to a zero. So what one is saying is that at time zero, this probability of bit flip is actually zero, right? And at some very long time, right, which you can think of as infinity, what should happen? The state should get flipped with very high probability, right? But essentially, so, so what do you think will be this infinite limit value of P? So let me say T tends to infinity. And this is at P0. Sorry? Can you speak up? So what do you think should happen in the infinite time limit? 0.5 exactly yeah yeah indeed so i guess you might be tempted to say that p should become one but you see p become one then tells me that if i wait long enough i know that my bit has flipped to one right which you know nature may not be so kind right what might actually happen is this which is that at very long times, there becomes an equal likelihood of the state having remained itself or having flipped. And this you see is the extremely noisy scenario. If I knew that if I waited long enough, the state was anyway going to flip, then I pretend like the state has flipped and then I proceed, right? So that's not a case of extreme noise. On the other hand, at very initial time, I have just prepared my state, I have not given it enough time to interact with an environment and undergo this noise. So then I know that my state is what I intended it to be. But it is this intermediate time where some time has elapsed, right? And then I don't know what has happened to the state. I don't know in the sense that it has become a probabilistic um, event that the state could have remained what it was or it could have flipped. This results in the scenario where the state is now only represented as a mixture, right? And so on. So this is where the uh, situation gets tricky. And the infinite time limit of this thing is not going to be typically a deterministic thing. It's going to be this half. And why is this half important? Because what happens at this, at this situation? So if I say the channel at t tending to infinity of rho, what is this? This is with probability half rho and with probability half, it is x rho x. Now imagine you started with zero, then what happens? You get exactly half zero zero plus half, oops, half one one. And you imagine you started with one, then you again end up with half zero zero plus half, 1 1 right so this is all i'm saying in this t tends to infinity limit so now if i were to think of this visualize this on the block sphere so you have to imagine that this is a sphere first um and then so what is happening let's look at this on the block sphere i know that i made this a part of the tutorial as well i don't know how many of you solved this problem uh, or worked out what happens because of the action of bit flip and face flip on the block sphere. Uh, but it's extremely insightful to do this exercise. So in this case, we are starting with zero or one, right? And remember that zero is the north pole and one is the state on the, the south pole. So what is one saying? One saying that at very, at very small times, 
what is happening with some probability the zero will get flipped to one but that probability is very small right so for some intermediate value of p you are in this situation where you have gone to one minus p zero plus p one one which means you are somewhere in the interior of the block sphere right so you have moved somewhere here where with some probability p you have some uh, part of one here right this is a density matrix which contains which, which is a mixture of the pure state at the two extremes right which is the zero and the one here so as time progresses you're progressively going towards the interior of the block sphere until at some point you have actually reached this state and what is this state what is this half zero plus half one this is nothing but i by two and remember this is indeed the state at the origin this is the state at the center of the block sphere so the value of p in some sense tells you where you are in this flow right and the action of these maps can be represented as a flow on the block sphere and i am just i have just represented the flow for the zero and the one state but more generally, you can imagine that every state on the block sphere, which is at the surface of the block sphere, is moving towards the interior, right? That's what the action of this channel does. And how far you have moved into the interior depends on the value of P. And the longer you wait, the more you have moved inside the block sphere. And all of this flow is directed towards the center of the block sphere. In particular, if I start with 0 or 1, I end up with this equal mixture of 0 and 1, which is nothing but the state at the origin. But before I draw any further arrows, I have to be careful because I should also understand uh, what are the fixed points of this map. When I talk about a flow and so on, then obviously there is some notion of a fixed point. And we just saw what happens to 0 and 1, but Say, for example, what happens to plus and minus? Can you think about that? So, what if the input state was plus? What is the action of the bit flip channel on plus? Can someone tell me what is the output state? Zero. Zero. What does that mean? Get zero. Zero, zero. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, one minus p plus, uh, I mean, get plus plus and p minus. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, right. Oh. Right, correct. Okay. One minus p plus 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 and p. p minus. How did you get P minus minus? What is the action of X on oh, KET plus? Is this is X, no? We're talking bit clip channel. Right, okay. hmm. So? It will remain plus plus, right? Indeed, it remains plus plus. Good. What about minus minus? Remember that plus and minus are eigenstates of the X operator. In other words, they are eigenstates of your error operator. Remember the error operator here is the X, right? Hmm. So, what happens to if your input state is minus minus? It will also remain minus minus. Indeed. There doesn't have to be a question in your voice. It has to be a very confident answer. Yes. So, please check this. Okay. And what happens if I start with 
alpha plus 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 beta minus minus, which is a convex mixture of plus and minus. Of course, I should make sure that alpha plus beta is one for this to be a valid density matrix. So of course, once I've written these two equations, it's clear that these kind of mixtures are also unaffected, right? So what are these kind of mixtures? They are states which lie on this uh, x-axis here, right? So, so what one is trying to say is that under the action of this map, while the z-axis shrinks, okay, while states which are on the surface, of course, move towards the interior, they move in a peculiar way. It's not like the sphere is uniformly shrinking all the way down to the center, right? Rather, there is a set of fixed points or there is a set of invariant points on the block sphere, which remain unaffected by the action of map. So now can someone tell me what is this set of fixed points? So there is a set of fixed points. It's not just the center of the block sphere, which remains fixed under the action of the map. But yes, what are the fixed points? Plus and my X axis itself will be invariant. Indeed. So the x-axis itself is a set of fixed points. So it's not just plus and minus. That's what I was trying to communicate with this example, that you take a convex mixture of x plus and minus, that is also left invariant by the action of the map. So you saw three points, right? You saw this point here at the end plus, you saw this point here, which is plus. Of course, the middle point, if I start with half zero plus half one like this, clearly the bit flip channel will flip 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 and you will end up again with half 0 plus half 1, right? That's the origin. But it's not just this. All the points along this x-axis, excuse me, remain unaffected by the action of this map. So this map is going to shrink the block sphere in a way that uh, it leaves the x-axis unaffected. So after some time, what you're going to ha uh, have is no longer a sphere, but some kind of ellipsoid, right? So after a certain amount of time, what you're going to have is something like this, right? So it's going to shrink the sphere into an ellipsoid whose semi-major axis is the x-axis. Is this visualization clear? We're just arguing based on, it's just a simple map. It has two cross operators, identity and X. And you know that uh, X has two eigenstates, right? So obviously those states must have some preferential role in the action of this kind of a map, right? And then the zero and the one are the states which are affected the most by the action of this map, okay? And so you can sort of already see from this geometric picture that the set of fixed points is indeed the entire x-axis of the block sphere. The x-axis has pure and mixed states. The pure states are the states which hit the surface of the sphere. That's the ket plus and the ket minus. Of course, the middle is the most mixed state. And then you have all other uh, convex combinations lying along the x-axis. And you've gone from what was a sphere to an ellipsoid whose uh, semi-major axis is the x-axis. And at t tending to infinity, which is the, you know, you uh, waiting for a very long time, then you're going to end up with a state which is on the x-axis itself. So eventually you will hit the x-axis, right? Is this idea clear? So this function, what kind of function is it? Now, 
uh, I'm going to write down a model for this. Now, this model, you can say, comes from sort of physical considerations. And this model is known to be true in cases where you have a channel with a clear underlying physical model. So such an example was this amplitude damping channel, which you look, which was, there was a big tutorial problem on that, right? But in, in general, this behavior of this function is thought to be exponential. This probability function, the probability with which the error is going to happen is modeled as a exponential function. So the idea is that you have P essentially going as one minus E to the minus T by some capital T. Uh, just check that what I've written makes sense and there should be an overall factor of half, I think. Yeah. Okay. So now make sure that this satisfies whatever I wrote down. At T tending to zero, T becomes zero. At T tending to infinity, T becomes half, right? And there is some intermediate time scale beyond which you know that the state has more likely been corrupted than not, right? And that characteristic time scale is this T, capital T out here. So this capital T is what is often called a decoherence time. Well, it depends. Sometimes people call it a coherence time. Uh, I call it a decoherence time. But the idea is that once T has approached capital T, then you know that this probability is very has started getting close to a half. It is no longer close to a zero. It is more closer to a half, right? And so you know that with very high probability, your state has flipped or your state has been affected by the X error. Okay, so this this capital T essentially gives you a kind of characteristic time scale for the problem. And this T is what you will find mentioned when you look at, when you open your IBM processor, the IBM Q online or any of these cloud-based quantum processors, they will tell you what is the coherence time of the qubit. So that is the time up to which the qubit remains fairly stable or the qubit is not so affected by the noise. However, you should understand that it is not as if the zero will remain a zero all the way through the coherence time. It will flip, but the probability of it flipping is much lesser provided you are away from this coherence time or the decoherence time. And for different qubits, you will find different time scales mentioned. So we, the time when I was a grad student like you guys, we were at coherence times of nanoseconds. Today, we are somewhere in this regime where you are between microseconds and milliseconds, right? And then you do have architectures where these coherence times are of the order of seconds even, right? So we have <clears throat> come a long way, but there is still some distance to go before you have really stable qubits, right? So today these are somewhere in the regime of milliseconds to microseconds. So I hope this idea of coherence time now makes sense. It sits here in these CPTP maps, in these noise maps, as the noise in as a characteristic time scale for the noise parameter or the probability with which the state gets affected by the noise. Okay, so this was what I wanted to discuss as far as the bit flip is concerned. Questions? So this was just one example. Uh, we can move Bam, on. To uh, yeah. Yeah, this uh, probability expression you gave is uh, only for bit flip uh, channel or uh, for in general for all? Yeah, so this is a kind of universal, uh, I would say, function for P that we typically write down. And like I said, the idea that this fall should be exponential, like it's a very nice function, right? Why should it be exponential? So you find that in most of these physical models of system bath interaction, once you do this, the physics of the problem, you will typically find this exponential sitting in these Krauss operators, this exponential function of time. So this is usually, I mean, you can think, think of this as a kind of universal behavior of the noise parameter. Okay, so I'll write down something similar for the phase flip channel as well. 
Yeah, so the short answer to your question, Nilesh, is yes. This is the form that we assume for most quantum channels. Okay. So the phase flip is basically also called um, a dephasing channel. And this is a channel which has no classical analog. It basically does to plus and minus what um, the bit flip does to zero and one. Okay. This is P. And so the action on any arbitrary state can be modeled in terms of the Z operator now. So this has two Krauss operators. Namely, square root 1 minus p identity and square root p z. Um, once again, you can write down what happens on the block sphere. So, by the way, uh, did you guys work out this problem where I had asked, I think, uh, particularly for bit flip and phase flip? Uh, you start with an arbitrary density operator like this, which is half identity plus rx x plus ry y plus rz z remember this is a the general description of a density operator and i had asked you to work out what is the once i act one of these channels so i'll call this e sub p to say that this is a phase flip right i get some state so what is the block vector for this state so what is the new rx prime ry prime rz prime i had asked you to work this out did anyone work this out or was this done in the tutorial can you tell me what this is in terms of p nobody worked this out So in the case of the, let's do this for the phase flip at least, okay? Please work it out with me if you haven't worked it out. So in the case of phase flip, now um, the scenario changes, right? What, what are the, uh, how does the block sphere shrink? Of course, it shrinks again. Pure states go to mixed states. So the block sphere shrinks again. But how does it shrink? And what are the fixed points now? So can someone tell me that? So what are the fixed points of this? Uh, the density matrix, the line spanned by the matrices of uh, cat zero and cat one. Yeah, so you're saying that all mixtures of zero and one, right? Yes. Indeed. So, which is what? I think someone said that. So that's the z axis, right? So this, all states on the z axis now become fixed points, right? And the way to see that is to look at what happens when the phase flip acts on ket 0. Then with 1 minus p, it remains 0. And then with p, what is z acting on 0? Well, it is 0, right? So this is just ket 0. Similarly, on ket 1 as well, of course, 1 is a minus 1 eigenstate, but then I have the projector on 1, right? So the projector on 1 remains 1. So these two are the fixed points. But these are not the only fixed points. There is, so note that for both these channels, there is an infinity of fixed points, right? Because any mixture of 0 and 1 like this is also a fixed point. And so that leads us to the fact that all states on the z axis are fixed points. On the other hand, if I start with plus, then what happens? What is the action of the phase flip channel on plus so this is of course 1 minus p plus but plus gets flipped to minus right that's the action of the z operator right so 0 and 1 are of course the eigenstates of z so you see a pattern to this right that those which are the eigenstates of your noise operator Remember, there are two Krauss operators. Identity does nothing, but the main noise comes from the Z operator. So if I have states which are left invariant by the Z operator, those are nothing but the eigenstates of Z. 
then those in turn become the invariant states for the map as well right and so the, now the block sphere shrinks like this right because the plus and the minus obviously go interior right and what we observed there you can observe here that as now as p tends to infinity i'm sorry as 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 t tends to infinity then once again p tends to a half so then we end up with half plus 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 half minus minus and note that this is again identity by 2 right half plus 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 half minus minus is again the maximally mixed state that is just identity by 2 right so once again you end up the plus and the minus get mapped to the center of the block sphere and various other states get mapped to various points on the z axis so now the shrinking happens in such a way that at some intermediate time i am going to have an ellipsoid with the semi major axis which is parallel to the z axis right so this is how the block sphere shrinks and all states which are along the z axis uh, remain invariant they are the fixed points of the map um, and as t tends to infinity i end up with states on the z axis itself right once again the behavior of this p parameter can be modeled as half 1 minus e to the minus t by capital t now there was one t that i wrote down there and there's another t that i wrote down here so you can ask what do people mean when they actually say coherence time right so there is if you look at the literature if you look at um, specifications of any of these qubits uh, which are being built by various groups they will talk about a t2 coherence time okay this t2 time is the time that figures in the description of the phase damping or the dephasing noise i hope you understand why the term phase right uh, or dephasing because of the fact that the noise is now the z noise and the z essentially affects the relative phase when i have a superposition of the form plus or minus right and this phase noise is what is governed by a t2 coherence time there is one more time that you will often find which is used to describe how good a certain qubit is and that is the t1 time and that has to do with a different kind of noise which is called amplitude damping noise so that's what i'm coming to next uh, but any questions on the phase uh, damping okay this now this is something that you guys have to work out so either you all haven't worked out or you're somehow reluctant to tell me the answer to this so uh, how does the block vector associated with the density operator change under the action of one of these maps okay so let me if there is silence i assume that nobody has worked it out so i'm going to work it out now um, so the question is how does the block sphere change the block vector change so i start with an rx ry rz and let's say that you're talking about the phase flip noise or the phase damping noise so you end up with a different density matrix right so what is the block sphere and let's say that this is parameterized by this little p right so what is the final block sphere so you simply have to do this right um, acting on rho so this gives me 1 minus p rho plus p z rho z so that's 1 minus p identity by 2 plus rx x ry y plus rz z by 2 uh, plus p times again i have i by 2 right plus r x um, so now i have z x z okay 
and R Y again has a Z Y Z. But the R Z simply remains R Z Z by two. Right. So now if I put things together, I see that I simply have I by two, which is as it should be, right? Nothing should happen to the identity out here plus R X and R Y will come to that. But what about R Z? So I have one minus P R Z Z by two and P R Z. So once again, I have R Z Z by two. And then here something has happened, which is I basically get. So what is Z X Z? I hope you realize that it's minus x and z y z is minus y. So I simply have 1 minus 2 p r x x by 2 and 1 minus 2 p r y y by 2. So I can now write this as a new density matrix with block vectors r x prime, r y prime, r z prime, where Rx prime is 1 minus 2 P Rx. Ry prime is 1 minus 2 P Ry. And Rz prime is Rz. Is this clear? So this again should tell you that the Z component is what remains invariant. So obviously the Z axis remains invariant. So this is again a clue as to where the fixed points of the map lie. And at any intermediate value of P, which is not 0 or a half, what shrinks is shrinkage along the X and the Y components, right? Any questions on this? So please work this out for all the channels that we described. And notice, of course, that nothing happens to this identity part of it. And that has to do with the special property of these channels as well. And what is that property? This was also given in the tutorial. Okay, we will come to that. Let me like quickly describe the, yeah. Was there a question or comment? Okay, so we spoke about the X error and the Z error. Now, of course, I could have the X and the Z error, right? There is such a channel, you can think in terms of a Y error, for example. So let me write that on the side here. I'm not going to write that as a... Uh, so Nielsen Chuang describes this as a bit face flip channel, which is nothing but a channel with Y error, right? So in other words, I'll have Krauss operators of the form square root 1 minus P identity and square root P Y, right? So this is another channel we could consider. But more generally, I could have a combination of these errors. I could have, so when I say bit and face flip, it means they're both occurring together, right? It's like X times Z is Y, right? And so together I get this Y error. But I could independently have X error or Z error or Y error happening with some probabilities. And that is what is captured by the idea of the depolarizing channel. In other words, you now have four Krauss operators. So you have identity, of course, which means nothing happens. And then you have X, Y, and Z. But now they have to occur in such a way that together they form a trace-preserving map. And remember, this trace-preserving condition always has to be satisfied, which is EI dagger, EI is identity, right? So let's put down some uh, pro uh, probabilities for this essentially. And I'm going to make this a symmetric depolarizing channel, which means that the probability of the X, Y, and Z errors is the same, which is obviously should be much smaller typically than the probability of nothing happening to the qubit, which is the identity term. So my Krauss operators are of the form square root one minus P identity. And then I have square root p over 3x, square root p over 3z, and square root p over 3y. So how do I write this channel down? I put a subscript d to say that this is depolarizing. 
So this is 1 minus P rho plus P by 3 x rho x dagger P by 3 y rho y dagger. Right? This is the full description of the channel. Now it turns out that there is an alternate way to represent this channel. And that alternate way comes from the fact that this part can essentially be replaced by identity. So I'm going to note a fact here. And this is a fact that I will leave it to you to prove. If you can't prove this, please let me know tomorrow and I'll work it out in class. But I need you to ask me. Okay. Otherwise, I will not work this out. But this is a fact that you must prove as homework. And this is the following interesting fact that I can write down identity as following. I can write this down as 1 by 4 rho plus 1 by 4 x rho x dagger plus 1 fourth y rho y dagger plus 1 fourth z rho z dagger. This is a very important fact as you can see. And this is of course true for all density operators. And this is for any so for any density operator, I can obtain a decomposition of identity in this fashion. Another way of thinking about it is if I act with equal probability the three Pauli operators x, y and z on a density operator and the identity. Of course, remember that identity x, y, z are important. They form a basis for qubit operators, for operators on qubits. So if I act on a given density operator with equal probability, and that's why the one fourth, one fourth everywhere, with these four operators, then I get the maximally mixed state. Okay. So this is an important property of Pauli operators, something that we have not covered so far. So think about how you'll prove this. And if you can't, you please ask me tomorrow and I will prove this in class. But if you take this fact uh, as proven, then you can notice that the depolarizing channel has a very simple description. It So I have a one third here. So essentially I multiply this whole thing by a four by three, right? And when I do that, um, I have to do some normalization out here so essentially what i will end up with is this so this becomes 1 minus 4p by 3 rho plus 4p by 3 identity by 2 so it doesn't matter let me call 4p by 3 as some q right which is some other parameter which lies between 0 and 1 right so this is 1 minus q rho plus q identity by 2. So you see what has happened is that the depolarizing channel essentially maps uh, the density operator with some probability. It maps the density operator to the maximally mixed state and with some probability it does nothing. So remember this is the maximally mixed state and now it's very easy for you to understand fixed point and all that for this map because you see you start out anywhere on the block sphere now remember that you have three error operators x y and z and if you recall what happened if there was only z error then the shrinkage was along the x and the y if there was only x error, then obviously the shrinkage is along the y and the z. But now there is all three, right? So in some sense, the sphere is now being shrunk symmetrically in this case, along all possible directions equally in a symmetric way. And ultimately, every density operator, no matter where it is on the block sphere, whether it's on the surface or whether it's deep inside, with some probability, it's getting mapped to the center of the block sphere. And with some probability, it's left invariant. So eventually, where should you converge? 
So where is the fixed point for this map? The origin. Indeed. So in the limit of infinite time, the fixed point for this map is simply the maximally mixed state, which is the origin. So oh, again, just one question, yeah. Yeah. So when we say in the infinite in the limit of time infinity, yeah, uh, we need to say that uh, as the bit stream is going through the like the channel. Yeah. See the way I have described channel so far is in a sort of passive sense, right? Um, so what you are talking about is something like this, where I have my input. I have a noise channel here. Now this box represents some channel and then there is the output, right? The way I described it is a kind of preparation error. Like I prepare some state and then before some gate acts on it, the state changes and the state changes because of this interaction with its own environment, right? So this also what you are talking about is also a, Indeed, another valid way of looking at it here, you're thinking more in terms of a communication channel kind of setting. Right, right. The idea is that if your state has spent long enough in this channel, so this channel could, for example, be some spool of fiber, right, through which your state has to go. And if your state, indeed, this for the repolarizing model, for example, can be thought of in the context of optical communication channels. So I have some input state, which is going through some long spool of fiber and then it's coming out, right? And what happens in the interim is that it's polarized. Then, uh, for example, if, if your polarization qubit is your degree of freedom, then that can get depolarized, right? So yes, then in that case, the time captures the length of time for which the qubit or the state has spent in this communication channel, right? So that is where your P of T would come from. Is that clear? So at every so instant of time, the, the gate is being, uh, like the, um, of the map acts on the state multiple times for every instant of time. Indeed. So these maps, okay, so I see where your question is coming from. So these are, are uh, so these are what are called dynamical maps, right? And the idea is that, so at time zero, I have the map with uh, some parameter P, right? Acting on row zero. Now, yeah, I mean, okay, I'm not saying this very well. So let me say this is P of P. So then this gives me row of P. Now, if I want to go from row of t to row of t plus 1, I have to look at a map whose p is essentially capturing some time interval delta t. So, maybe I'll write it like that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, let me say p of delta t and that acts on row of t. That gives me row of p plus delta t. And then again and again and again. So, the idea is that so you can think of, for example, these little arrows that I draw, you can think of this as representing some time delta t, right? Uh, and the idea of a dynamical map is that every time step delta t, the state, whatever is the state is being acted on by this map, right? And the time then is hidden in this q, and the, this q will then be like q of delta t. Is that clear? Uh, yes. Maybe, yeah. I, I suppose this, this statement should make it clear. So. When I say P of T, it takes me from 0 to T. When I say P of delta T, it takes me from T to T plus delta T. Okay. Yeah. So the noise parameter, essentially, what is important to take away is that the noise parameter has time hidden in it. And depending on whether it's a small time step or a large time step, the noise parameter is going to scale accordingly. Right. And the way it grows, again, in this case also, you have this sort of exponential uh, fall happening. So once again, it's half, 1 minus e to the minus t by some capital T. And in this case, this time, coherence time, will capture the depolarizing time for the qubit, right? And you can see that as t tends to a half, you have equally likely scenario of having the 
original density matrix with the original state and the maximally mixed state. Okay. I hope the idea is clear. Yes, ma'am. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, indeed, so now in intermediate time, you will have here again a sphere in the case of the depolarizing channel. Unlike in the other two cases, the bit flip and the face flip, where you had a preferential direction of flow on the block sphere, it shrank along particular directions so that you were left with ellipsoids with semi major axis and all that. In this case, you're going to be left with a sphere because there's uniform shrinkage along the X, Y, and Z, right? So in this case, at some intermediate P, you will end up with the with another sphere, but shrunk version of the original block sphere. So once again, I leave it to you guys to work out what this Rx prime, Ry prime, Rz prime are after the action of the depolarizing channel. Okay. So we did this exercise for the face flip now. So this again will lead me to a different uh, block vector, but there are enough clues in this geometric picture to tell you how, how this should be a function of the original Rx, Ry, and Rz. Okay. Fine. So these three channels that I described, all of them have something in common, which is that nothing happens to the identity. So let me write this out now. So because I'm going to now discuss an example where this is not true. So note all three channels. So I will call these as Pauli noise channels. So whether it is bit flip, or face flip or depolarizing. Remember that the errors are all Pauli operators, right? In this case, it's all three Paulis, right? These are all Pauli noise channels and in all three cases, they preserve the I by two state, right? What is this state? This is the maximally mixed state. And this is the state at the center of the block sphere. And all of them have include that in their set of fixed points. Of course, in the case of the depolarizing channel, it's interesting. Note that the fix, there is a unique fixed point. So it's a, it's a unique fixed point. There's only one fixed point for the depolarizing channel. Unlike the case of the bit flip or the face flip where you had an infinity of fixed points, the entire X axis or the entire Z axis were fixed points. In this case, it's a unique fixed point. Okay, so all of them preserve the maximally mixed state. In other words, they have this property. So I can leave out the half. The half is just a normalization to make it a state. They have this property that E of I is identity. And channels which have this property are called Unital channels. Again, you should have seen this in the tutorial if you have solved the tutorial. So what is the property of a unital channel? This essentially defines a unital channel. It is identity preserving. And because of this reason, the Krauss operators satisfy a peculiar property. So what is E acting on identity? It is EI. I, E I dagger, so that is nothing but sum over I, E I, E I dagger, and that is identity. So note that trace preserving would mean sum over I, E I dagger, E I is identity, but unital means sum over I, E I, E I dagger, is identity. Okay. One property does not imply the other. They are both distinct properties of a quantum channel. And all the Pauli channels, it will turn out, are indeed unital channels. They will all preserve identity. Okay. So now I'm going to give you an example of a channel which is non-unital. Right. So the 
example and this is what is called the amplitude damping channel this is a channel with two cross operators so i will stop with describing this channel then we'll continue tomorrow so this is described with two cross operators which i will call e0 and e1 i think that's what i call this in the tutorial as well so e0 is a matrix with 1 0 0 square root 1 minus p and e1 is 0 square root p 0 0 so now you see the Krauss operators have nothing to do with Pauli's. I mean, they are not Pauli's. Neither is identity one of the Krauss operators. In all the, all, the, all the other cases, I had identity as one of the Krauss operators. But what kind of channel is this? What is it doing to the state? Of course, I can write down the general action on a density operator like this. It's E0, 0 dagger, plus E1, rho, E1 dagger right but what happens for example to ket zero so if i started with ket zero what does so this is to understand its action better so what does e zero do to ket zero well it does nothing what does it do to ket one it simply taps it to square root one minus p one what does e one do to ket zero you can see that it takes it to square root p ket 1 and e1 acting on ket 0 is actually 0. In some sense, it completely annihilates the ket 1. Right? Uh, did I say that correctly? Is this right or is it the other way around? The other way around. Exactly. Good. Thank you. So, e1 acting on ket 1 takes you to ket 0 and E1 acting on ket 0 is 0, right? So what does this channel do? How does one describe what it does in this kind of cartoon picture that we are used to, right? So are all these four lines possible or is something else happening out here? So clearly there is some probability with which uh, there is some probability with which 1 remains 1 and 0 remains 0. Let me say that this probability may be 1 minus p. But what is happening in terms of the flipping? What's happening in terms of ket1 becoming ket0 and ket0 becoming ket1? You see, there is no pathway for ket0 to go to ket1 in this case. So, this actually doesn't happen. Rather, there is some probability for ket1 to go to ket0 and that probability is p. Ket0 actually just remains unaffected or it just gets, ma it just gets annihilated altogether. Right? So, what this means is ket0 actually doesn't get affected by this map. What happens is 1 could remain 1 with probability 1 minus p or it could become 0 with probability p. Now this is actually a much more realistic model as far as quantum states are concerned because what is ket0 and ket1 typically? Ket0 would be the ground state of some system, right? It's a ground state of a quantum system usually and ket1 is the excited state. So normally you would assume that it's much more likely for this excited state to decay to the ground state and it, you know, typically these are accompanied by the release of a photon rather than for the ground state to actually spontaneously go to the excited state. <laughs> so this kind of a model captures this, what is called dissipation in physical systems much better than say a bit flip where there's an equal likelihood of the zero and the one flipping to each other. So this is a channel which captures essentially this process that with some probability the excited state decays to a ground state. So the one becomes a zero and this is accompanied usually by the release of a photon. But there is no probability for the zero to go to a one. Okay. 
So let me stop here. Um, and we'll discuss this channel a little bit more in tomorrow's lecture, and then we'll move on to talking about a few other things. Starting next week, or rather whenever we meet, okay? So yeah, they are very much contractions, and that is the reason why they all have these uh, fixed points. And depending on their property, they could either have unique fixed points or they could have multiple fixed points. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that kind of that is actually the reason why they have like they lose information. Indeed, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you will see uh, next time we look at what could be the fixed point for amplitude damping, for example, in tomorrow's uh, class, and that will give you an indication of it'll give you a very different kind of picture from what the other Pauli channels do. Right. So it will show you that, for example, the fixed point could even be a pure state, a particular pure state, it may not be like the center of the block sphere and so on. Yeah, so this whole thing captures the idea that pure states become mixed states and this happens in a way which is beyond, say, um, it's, it's uncontrolled kind of way that this happens. And that is why this is noise. And that is why, you know, we need, we need a way to overcome this if we have to do quantum computing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other questions? All right. If not, then I'll see you all tomorrow. And uh, yeah, I'll circulate uh, a message on the WhatsApp group regarding the extra lecture. Uh, it may not happen this Saturday. It may actually actually happen next Saturday. Um, I'll yeah, but I'll fix a time after consulting with all of you. Okay, see you then.